Welcome to the strangest of all interview with Peter Watts. My name is Julie Novakova and I'm interviewing the amazing authors who contributed to my anthology Strangest of All, which is a book of astrobiological science fiction stories accompanied by non-fiction essays and classroom use tips that I developed for the European Astrobiology Institute as an outreach and educational project. The book is available for a free download in several ebook formats on my website julinovakova.com and on the website of the European Astrobiology Institute, europeanastrobiology.eu. Today it's my pleasure to welcome here Peter Watts, who is a Canadian award-winning author with a background in marine biology. His career as a writer started uh, with short stories and also uh, the Rifters trilogy, starting with the novel Starfish, which was very critically acclaimed. And he is best known for his novel Blindsight, which was nominated for the Hugo Award, and its sequel Echopraxia. His most recent work is a collection of essays titled Peter Watts is an angry sentient tumor, published at Tachyon. And his most recent uh, longer work of fiction is The Freeze Frame Revolution, also published at Tachyon. You can find most of Peter's fiction for free on his website rifters.com. And let me just mention that his novella The Island, which is reprinted in Strangest of All, has won the Hugo Award for the year uh, 2009. So uh, let me uh, welcome Peter here. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. And My pleasure. Uh I would just like to point out that I was, in fact, not quite so gray when we started trying to connect. Um, I was actually quite a bit more youthful uh, <laughs> before we, we finally actually managed to make the connection work here. So just so Me everybody too, knows, I, I mean... didn't start off looking like the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> yes, for the viewers, previously to this, we spent 40 minutes trying to make Jitsi meat work. And I am so sorry about that. But anyway, let's start with the questions. And uh, probably most of the viewers uh, know about this, but let me recap that Strangest of All is an anthology of uh, science fiction stories with astrobiological topics. And each is accompanied by a popular science essay, uh, which has references at the end and also some tips for the classroom use. But uh, using science fiction uh, in combination with scientific material is nothing new for you because already Starfish had uh, quite a lot of accompanying material which was uh, an amazing addition to the book. So uh, how have you found uh, that it helps readers or uh, what were the most frequent reactions to accompanying your fiction with scientific references and you know non-fiction essays, and more generally, uh, how do you see the role of science fiction in uh, science education and outreach? Well, the um, the reader reaction that I'm uh, that I'm most familiar with are basically follows a bimodal distribution. You either have people saying, um, wow, this is really cool. You can actually follow and explore further into the ideas and concepts that he explored in his, in his novel. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got people saying, wow, these peer reviewed technical references from highly abstruse journals are far more interesting than the actual story was. Why didn't he just, why didn't he just write a damn essay? Um, <laughs> My only, my, my main reason for, for doing these things, of course, uh, for, for tacking technical references onto the end of my novels in the first place, uh, it basically comes down to insecurity. Um, when I was getting my degrees, I was always, you know, I was part of that group that was playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, while everybody else was nose down, convinced they were going to get published in science or nature before they graduated. Mm -hmm. uh, so leaving academia and going into science fiction amongst some porters anyway is like one step up from going into child molestation as a prof as a profession so i tend to tack 
I tended to tack on technical references kind of as a, a rear guard action to prove that I still had some kind of tenuous connection to academia and that I wasn't just wildly speculating. And also, if anybody had any problems with the stuff that I was writing, I could always say, hey, don't take it up with me. Take it up with this guy. He got published in Nature. Um, so, yeah, I, I love the fact that people track those references down. And in fact, in some cases, I've used the wrong reference by mistake, and people have read the references and called me on it, which is great because people are actually reading them. Yeah. But I wasn't being especially noble when I did it. I just thought it would be a neat shtick. It, it kind of covered my ass against nitpickers who probably wouldn't be caught dead reading my stuff anyway. And and also, it was something that like really nobody else was doing. So it, it allowed me to stand out from the crowd a bit. Um, Science fiction and its role in education. Yes. I don't know. I've. I mean, we always hear of science fiction as an inspiration, but that's more indirect. I mean, people reading SF as children and pursuing science or tech degrees later. But uh, do you see uh, some more direct use or impacts? I'm of two minds of that. My own work has um, proven an inspirational in some cases. I've had people say, I went, I just, I changed my major. I went into neuroscience. I went into marine biology because I read this, that, or the other thing. And that's always cool. Um, it doesn't actually stop with education. There's, there's one guy who actually says he bases some of his research um, on ideas that I explored in Maelstrom. And he works at the Lawrence Livermore Labs, which is basically US military. He can't tell me what, what I inspired because I don't have the security clearance. <laughs> so, so that's cool. Um, and it's nice to be inspirational and it is nice to provoke um, those kind of, of feelings and reactions. But that's not really education. That's that's giving somebody a sort of a cognitive boot in the ass to, to, to inspire them to get the education. On the other hand, I on one occasion wrote a story for a middle school book, basically that was all about taking science fictional ideas and using them to convey um, convey actual scientific concepts. And that was terrible. It was uh, <laughs> like all the, the middle schoolers who read it hated it because Everybody died at the end of the world caught fire and they didn't seem to actually grasp the whole idea that I was playing with is how do you define life and why couldn't fire be a life form? And if you want to spread life, why wouldn't an AI literally interpret that to mean firestorm the planet? Um, I think, I think in some cases we kind of bend over backwards to prove we're relevant. And yeah. maybe we're not. I think forcing people to read science fiction as a way of teaching them. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the, the high school or middle school version of the, the futurist consultant thing where you basically write little science fiction vignettes and give them to Coca-Cola or, or Chevrolet or whoever and pretend that you're speaking truth to power when basically you're just taking an awful lot of money to write a cute little story to tell power what it wants to hear. I, I think I think science fiction can be extremely educational. I'm less convinced that it has lived up to that potential within a formal educational context. Yeah, that's uh, that. one direction uh, I was going into because, uh, I mean, it's hard to force someone to read science fiction if they are just not up for it. And it, so it sounds like the middle schoolers weren't exactly your target audience because uh, no spoilers. But in many Peter stories, the world basically catches fire metaphorically, in this case, probably literally. <laughs> and lots of the characters die. But these stories are awesome. So go read them all. But anyway, uh, you ask whether science fiction matters and uh, Increasingly, nowadays, we see calls for 
more optimistic science fiction or science fiction that will aim at inspiring the future. So uh, can you tell us uh, what problem you see in that? Uh, and where That's do you personally just... think that science fiction I... should go if it should go anywhere? It's not just a, a question of science fiction. You actually see that in real science. Every time somebody comes out with um, another dire report on the state of the planet, uh, the state of, of climate change, you get the usual. And it's, it's, it's kind of scary because when it comes to things like climate change, the optimists have always been wrong. And the pessimists have always been too optimistic. And each report seems to say, hey, you know that worst case scenario that we had predicted 10 years ago? Well, it turns out that the data is even worse than that. And whenever this happens, you have the usual, the usual um, suspects jumping in saying, oh no, you can't talk like that. You have to give people hope. Otherwise people will simply wallow in a self-defeating morass of despair. And you, you get that in real science and you get it in science fiction. Um, and it's, it's latest incarnation is the hope punk movement, um, which I hold in a, a certain amount of contempt. Um, now I have nothing against upbeat science fiction stories. Even John Brunner, my sort of literary idol, John Brunner wrote some really upbeat stories. Um, and Cory Doctorow's stuff tends to be, I, I don't know how Doctorow can do this. Doctorow has... A, he's got, a, because of his sort of alter ego as a real life advocate, he, he has a very um, strong and grounded sense of global real politic. And yet he writes stories that are basically upbeat. Uh, I don't have any problem with any, I'm reading a um, friend of both uh, Corey's and mine, Carl Schrader has written a recent book called um, Stealing Worlds. I'm reading it now. I have absolutely no trouble with upbeat stories. Yeah. Um, but that's because science fiction's a big tent and it's got room for everything. The problem I have with the hope punks is not that they promote upbeat stories, it's that they shit upon downbeat ones. Ideologically, you've got articles ranging from Clark's World to Wired saying, stop writing dystopias, no more dystopias. Um, the argument as usual being Yes, if, if, if you get too grim and, and, and defeatist, then the entire world collapses into a whimpering puddle of perspiration and doesn't do anything. Um, Kelly Robson, you know, literally or rather figuratively stamped her foot and said, no more dystopias in a, a, Clark, a Clark's World uh, thing a few years ago, saying you, you only get to, you know, talk about solutions. And it's, it's a little bit like saying, you know, you go, don't get to tell me I have cancer unless you can cure cancer. Um, and it's, I also think, predicated on a bullshit premise, yeah. which is that, that bad news paralyzes. Uh, it's not, it's not supported by my own personal experience and it's not supported by empirical research. There's, there's uh, something called negativity bias. There's yeah. a, a vast body of, of studies that show that we actually pay more attention to bad news than good. You can see why evolution would shape us to do that, that we are, um, that we are configured to internalize bad news more than good. There is also a body of knowledge that shows that we are delusionally optimistic exactly. as a species. Um, and these two things aren't necessarily in 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 conflict yeah in conflict i mean it kind of sounds that they are but the the analogy i like to use is that you're you know you're the paranoid who thinks that everybody's out to get you but you're going to beat them all that's how these two sort of things work so we pay more attention to the bad news and, and there's all sorts of really cool studies that have been shown that that you know people in in situations of social unrest and so on tend to see patterns in random visual static more than people who feel comfortable with their lives, right? There's all sorts of, of stress relations and correlations that show that, that bad news is something we pay attention to. And exactly. on a personal note, I know I'm going on a little, I'm too wordy about this, but I think the problem is that we're not, we're not 
being too dire and too pessimistic. The problem is that we are delusionally optimistic as a species. We always think we'll muddle through somehow. And the fact that we won't has not yet sunk in. And to take one last point to conclude this rather lengthy response, um, it's hard to imagine a novel more downbeat than John Brunner's 1972 novel, The Sheep Look Up. Um, it literally had weather reports starting off with lead alcohol levels in the atmosphere and reports that the sun was out in Oregon <laughs> caused traffic jams and environmental activists being lynched in the street. It was a profoundly gloomy and depressing book and it changed my life. It's one of the two books that actually galvanized the course of my adult career. So both in terms of my own personal um, in terms of my own personal uh, experience and in terms of the literature and the research, I believe the hope punk ideology that we've got to stop writing about dystopias is bullshit. I mean, hell, even Kim Stanley Robinson has now been hammered by reality enough that he is actually saying that his bar for calling something utopia has degraded to the point that if it doesn't include a mass extinction event, he'll call it a win. Yeah, well, uh, you mentioned that two books brought you to your current career. Which was the other one? Uh, the other one was, um, it was probably less um, famous in science fiction world. Uh, it's by a Canadian called Farley Mowat. It was called A Whale for the Killing. And it was a story about um, basically what happened when a finback whale got trapped in a COVID Newfoundland and how the local Canadian Newfoundlanders reacted to it, which was basically to shoot it for fun and run over it with boats and basically torture it to death. Um, Farley Mowat is not a very popular writer in Newfoundland. And uh, he's also, um, I have a bit of a connection with him in that, in that he wrote a, a nonfiction article for a local paper in which he said that people in my lab were putting out the eyes of harbor porpoises with red hot pokers. This was back when I was doing my master's on harbor porpoises as well. And and when I called him on him, he, he produced another book called uh, Sea of Slaughter. When he produced another book, and he was on book tour. I actually called him on that and he apologized. He said he'd gotten, he actually told me who he'd gotten the information from um, and apologized for the fact that my friends were calling me up at two in the morning, demanding to know why I was putting out the eyes of harbor porpoises with red hot pokers. Um, so there's, there's been a fair amount of conflict over how true Farley Mowat's A Whale for the Killing actually was. But I always, I'd, I'd known I wanted to be a marine biologist since I was six, five or six years old. I knew I wanted to specialize in marine mammals after I read A Whale for the Killing. So, whether the book was bullshit or not, whether it unjustly tarred the noble salty of the earth people in Newfoundland or not, it put me on the course that I specialized in, right? So, and and I, I ended up as a result of, of Brunner and as a result of Mowat, I ended up doing conservation work on marine mammals. I did an intervener report on the impact of, of, of hydroelectric development in um in northern in northern quebec i i did a I, I wrote a screenplay for a a documentary that won a few awards um i'm not going to tell you what it was because i'm actually quite ashamed of how it turned out i don't think it's a very good documentary but it both won the the environment canada trophy which is a government award for best film on the environment that year and was also decried by a different branch of the same government as anti-canadian propaganda Oh, <laughs> so you had people along the gas bay running these little tourist government tourist kiosks playing this this documentary for the tourists, which, which the government had given its highest award to. And then other people from the government would show up in their their black coats and sunglasses saying, you don't want to be showing that anti-Canadian propaganda here in this kiosk, do you? It'd be a shame if something happened to this nice little kiosk. Um, it was kind of a minor controversy for a while. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I ended up where I was. 
Yeah, that sounds interesting. And well, it brings us back to science and uh, let's say current trends in it. And you mentioned the, uh, I would agree, negative trend to smooth things up and, you know, uh, rephrase them on the more optimistic note, even if they aren't. But what other trends do you see in current science and how has it changed uh, both in methodology, policy, publishing, um, well, everything uh, since when you started? And where do you see it going or where, where would you uh, like it uh, to go? Because, for instance, in echopraxia, you uh, sort of uh, revealed the idea of uh, doing science with very unscientific methods, uh, as we would see it, uh, basically uh, arriving to scientific results through religion, through uh, speaking in tongues and other things that are basically irreproducible and at odds with uh, scientific methodology as we uh, know it. So basically, do you think that uh, science in the near future will stay uh, basically the same as it's now? Or do you predict some uh, radical changes in uh, how we arrive to knowledge? Um, well, first off, uh, a disclaimer. I haven't actually been part of academic science since the mid-90s. So my expertise has gone way, way past its best before date. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say I'm just pulling out of my ass. But for instance, you're seeing uh, scientific papers daily and you can see some changes like in the language and so because... Well, I mean, certainly, I, I mean, one thing that's kind of nice is that we get these personal pronouns now. Um, it may seem like a small thing, but it does, I think, enhance the clarity of of the writing when you're actually allowed to say, we did this as opposed to this was done it does make the writing more accessible. Um, along those lines, you've also got, I don't know if they're still doing it, for, but for the longest time, a decade at least, um, Nature was putting a science fiction short story on the back, on the back page of each, of each issue. Are they still doing that, do you know? Yeah, they are. I appeared a couple of times in Nature, and it was like great because I think all the last time was three years ago, right? Uh, with repeating the past? Um, I don't know. No, it was way, way further back than that. Really? Um, but it was it was kind of nice because all those people who sneered at me because I played Dungeons and Dragons and they were going to get into nature still haven't gotten into nature and, and I got into nature writing science fiction, so that was yeah reliving the past was kind of a fun story to write, um, and Hillcroft, um, Hillcrest versus Belikovsky I think was the more recent one, uh, but anyway there is a there is I think a, a tendency to. Um, to be more accessible in that way. I worry about the politicization of science to some extent. Um, I had something, Jesus, and it slipped my mind because I am old well, and I am in cognitive decline. Right. Well, in the meantime, yeah. we can uh, clarify to the viewers that uh, you basically left academia because of the politicization of science and because uh, the grant for... Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, I left, uh, but that was a particular type of science, right? Nobody really cares about marine mammals unless they're a whale hugger or unless they're a government fisheries biologist whose job is essentially to maximize fish for uh, that that's that's kind of a there's kind of a whore science versus versus curiosity driven science thing going on in any field of research with um cute or charismatic subject matter right um but one of the biggest problems uh, can be summed up by the fact that when I was in, it was starting to happen when I was in university, when I was doing my PhD. Um, but right now it's, they no longer call university students, students now. They call them clients. 
Really? <laughs> and getting it, yeah. This is something that's happened at. Um, this is something that happened at uh, UBC. It's something that happened at, at uh, University of Toronto. These are the places I have firsthand experience with. It's, it's happening throughout the world. The corporatization oh. of, of academia. So that basically the only things that get funding are things that are going to produce a better nose stick frying pan or something that's going to increase somebody's stock margin somewhere. Um, this is one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of effective cures for a lot of diseases, a lot of painful, debilitating diseases, because there's just no profit margin in curing them. Uh, yeah. When back there was a time in, in uh, I could cite, I tried to take a, a course in creative writing when I was doing my PhD, and they tried to charge me an extra $600. Now, I was entitled to take a certain number of courses. There was nothing in the calendar that said where I should have been able to take rocks for jocks if I wanted. There's absolutely nothing written down anywhere um, that said I couldn't take arts courses. But as far as they were concerned, I was in a science degree. And what the hell right did I have today to take an arts course? At U of T back then, this is back during the 90s, there was actually a requirement that in order to 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 graduate with an advanced degree in science, you had to take some arts courses, just make sure that you had a broad, a broad education, no longer the case. Right now, it's like, hey, this guy is taking something outside of his bailiwick. We get why not charge him an extra 600 bucks? This is uh, universities have become less about about peer research and more about resource extraction. And as a result of that, you have students quite legitimately saying, well, I've paid my money for my degree, so give me my fucking degree. Like, it doesn't matter if I failed all the tests. <laughs> well, to I clarify, paid for my degree. This is a transaction, right? And I think the corporatization of academia has, has done a lot of damage for science in the future. And then you've got the, then you've got the, the, the fact that there are certain people in the humanities department who basically um, dismiss and, and find as deeply wicked and evil certain basic evolutionary facts about the fact that we are, in fact, mammals. And they find that politically unpalatable uh, because their misunderstanding of evolutionary theory is that is that the entire edifice was simply built to promote a leave it to beaver, men are in control, women are subservient bullshit and there are a lot of really bad papers there are literally papers out there on why women evolved to shop and why girls prefer pink which they actually don't historically um so there's a lot of evo psych stuff out there that deserves to get shot upon but by the same token just because eric von daniken is a flake does not mean that you have that you have to throw at all of archaeology and I think that there's some politicization of of um, of that stuff. Things that happened at I think Evergreen University in Washington a few years back. That's absolutely appalling. Where science and the conveyance of scientific principles get shat upon because I hate to use the phrase political correctness because it was originally um, invented by Russians as a kind of a knowing wink. I mean, political correctness actually was meant as an ironic term when it was first yeah. designed. At least that, that's what I've, I've been led to understand. Uh, but I don't know what else to call it. Um, I think there is, especially in the States now, a strongly anti-science bent. I had somebody in Berlin tell me with a straight face recently that science is just another belief system. Yeah, that's kind of like the post postmodern philosophy <laughs> yeah yeah I, I don't have much patience for postmodernists who say i mean i've seen i've seen pictures of lecture theaters where the slide that's up there says all scientific principles or all scientific facts are social constructs and these people yeah, I'm kind be... of hearing this trend, but uh, 
as you mentioned, your uh, university experience uh, in Canada, it's um, kind of interesting for our European viewers to uh, compare the situation in North America and basically the Anglo-American world. Uh, you can also include the UK and the continental Europe, because in most of Europe's universities don't require any fees for students. Yeah. At least state run universities don't. So, I mean, uh, that, said, that said, the person who told me that science was just another belief system um, was a German. I, I met, I talked to her in Berlin. So yeah. it's not a, I mean, no, I, this grant you, I would, I would trade the issue, but, uh, basically the commercialization uh, seems to be more prevalent there as I see it. Oh yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I would, I would in a heartbeat trade the European attitude towards science for the North American attitude towards science, because the North American attitude towards science is, is it politically, will it get me votes and will it make me money? And then it's science. Um, well, I find that appalling. On the other yeah. hand, like you say, postmodernism isn't just a North American thing. And, and these people, these people who believe that scientific principles are, are social constructs. I mean, they must be absolutely amazed every time you flip a fucking light switch and it works. <laughs> like you would think that if enough of us just stopped believing in electricity, that light switches wouldn't work anymore. I, I, I am totally at a loss to understand. Actually, I'm not because you can see how natural selection promotes stupidity. So I, I, I yeah, will stop. In the current climate, both political and literal, uh, we need some ways to support uh, science education and perhaps more importantly to support critical thinking. So yeah. do you see any efficient ways of doing that or do you basically find it hopeless and hope that uh, just someone with some homemade CRISPR kit will unleash some <laughs> radical solution that will Probably you've been watching my you've been watching my lectures <laughs> and reading your stories. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I I am becoming um, increasingly receptive to the idea that basically, if there was like a Heath Ledger's Joker out there with a CRISPR kit, who, you know, just because they wanted to see the world burn, did something positive for a change, I. I, I I wouldn't necessarily turn my nose up at that. Um, <laughs> okay, but do you see of, any, let's say, easier solutions or something in the... I have a number of safety solutions, um, okay. which the whole punks generally don't seem to get involved in. I mean, one of them, just sheer Darwinian natural selection. Look what's happening now in the U.S. with COVID. You've got people demanding the right to go out and get infected. And then you've got other people who say, you know something, I'm going to stay home and not get infected. Basically, what we have here is a natural selection process that weeds out a disproportionate number of stupid people. Yes, the stupid people will infect other people. Yes, there's that whole problem about it. it's not just your life, it's the whole herd thing. But if the smarter people stay at home, and the stupid people are still the ones out there demanding their right to have a fucking haircut, which I could probably use at this point, but still, um, you're going to get a disproportionate um, mortality amongst dumb people. And if there is any heritable component at all to intelligence, that is going to increase the mean IQ of the human race infinitesimally over time. It won't happen fast enough to save anything. Um, my my greatest um, source of optimism at this point is that the Earth has undergone six major, five or six major, five, I guess, major extinction events, and that the biosphere has always managed to grow back. It's taken 20 to 30 million years each time, but a wonderful new complex organic biosphere has emerged from those ratty, weedy remnants that survived. And that's kind of a long-term form of optimism. Maybe next time around, there won't be anything like us to fuck things up again. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the kind of like uh, 
pessimistic optimism that uh, is prevalent in your stories where uh, basically the world goes to hell, but it's still the optimistic view uh, in terms of uh, what can be expected based on models and predictions. And it's at the same time very pessimistic as we, you know, watch people dying and uh, infrastructure collapsing and so. And uh, I, at the same time, understand that and uh, kind of uh, like share the uh, wish to uh, change the human nature somehow. But on the other hand, at the same time, I uh, wish for a world that, uh, you know, doesn't leave uh, people to die, even uh, if uh, it's, let's say, some of uh, their uh, own fault, because in some cases, uh, people just have to go outside, have to go to work, and you would probably call it like collateral damage. Uh, but, yeah. you know, I'm trying to balance these two points of view and uh, in an ideal world, we would try to arrive at some point where we promoted critical thinking in everyone or next to everyone and, you know, made people pay more attention to science. So. Do you see? Uh, I mean, you and me both, but the problem is that I think we're not actually wired for critical thinking. Okay, we're that's wired, true, but we we're can wired try. To, we're wired to get along with the tribe, right? We're wired to, there's a, a body of, of thought suggesting that, in fact, even, you know, Socratic debate, reasoning, argument, these things that we sort of consider to be the, the pinnacle of, of, of human intellect, that these things evolved um, not to, to arrive at the truth, but as a form of social control, to, uh, to achieve yeah, dominance. Achieve dominance and so signalize quality and such. Yeah, but and that, that, you know, whatever truth that came along, just kind of came along as a side effect. It's more of a spandrel than anything else. It's, I think we're fighting against our own natures. And I, I agree with you. I hope that we can. I hope that, uh, that we can at some point bring ourselves into check. But to take a, a much more benign example, right? If you really love ice cream, as I do, it takes willpower to not gorge yourself on ice cream all the time. And ice cream is bad for you. <laughs> on the other hand, if you loathe ice cream, you don't have to fight your inner demons. You don't have to show any self-control. The problem is that to us, all the things that are destroying the environment are ice cream, the short-term gratification, they get things now, they get things we don't really need. All these things driven by you know, this dopamine complex in our brains that keep us addicted, that keep us coming back for more. It would be so, I mean, the way to control that is either be a saint and just grit your teeth and restrain your appetite or shoot yourself up with nociceptin, which is basically the anti-dopamine molecule. It, it, interferes with dopamin dopaminogenic dogenic, I can never get that word you know what I mean dopamine related reward systems it takes the shine off certain addictive drugs it depression is one of its side effects but that's actually a feature not a bug because depressed people are more objective more, about the world more than, 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 than we are um, so there are biochemical ways that would say that that we could that would allow us to live sustainably, without having to constantly wrestle with our with these these fifty thousand year old instincts that once helped us to survive but are now destructive. If you get if you get rid of the drives, um, I mean, my God, wouldn't it be great if everybody yeah. didn't, their child was the center of the fucking universe? Wouldn't it be great if the first worlders just stopped breeding? Um, yeah, the, basically carbon impact of having a single first world child is just absolutely huge. I could fly, 
I could fly back and forth across the Atlantic almost every week of the year, and I still wouldn't have close to the impact of having a single first world child. If only we didn't just resist that impulse, if only we could get rid of it, then we would not suffer and we could live much more sustainably. This is not the sort of things that the, the hope punks want to talk about. Kelly Robson actually told me that she, at one point that she thought more children was the answer because she had more brains working oh. the problem. <laughs> I mean, on the other hand, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, the carbon impact is probably bigger. <laughs> but yeah, uh, basically, that's another instance where I kind of see both sides as right in a way. But uh, to come back to uh, teaching critical thinking, I was thinking more in lines of, you know, uh, tweaking the reward systems by teaching people from the very kindergarten, from the elementary schools, uh, what they should value in the environment and uh, how uh, they can actually uh, discover new knowledge using science, you know, to promote curiosity, to promote empathy, to uh, get the people in contact with nature. And uh, it's something that can be built because we are wired for immediate pleasures, but we aren't wired for hair dryers, for airplanes. It's just that uh, it's just that these are around in today's world. So we could try to replace these pleasures with something else. But yeah, it's a long run and uh, change would yeah, probably no, I... be slow and small. I completely agree. I think you're 100% right. The problem is the rules are being made by people who make their living and get their wealth from convincing us to take airplanes everywhere and and to buy stuff, hair dryers that we don't need. And those people, at least on this side of the planet, are pretty much running the educational system. When we got a conservative government here in Ontario, a few years ago, the first thing they did was they eliminated media studies the exact kind of critical thinking that you're advocating. They eliminated that from the high school curriculum yeah. because the point of school is not to make us question the, our authorities or our leaders. The point of going to school is to become a productive member of society, to become a good consumer. And you are 100% right. Starting kids at kindergarten and saying, this is a sustainable way to live. That's great, but what you gotta do first then is get rid of the vested interests who want to teach us exactly the opposite and who have much deeper pockets with which to do that. Yeah. How do we do that? Uh, uh, before we go back to science from which we straight a bit now, uh, I want to ask if you ever considered going into politics because I think that uh, we need to hear more of this and kind of juxtapose it to the more optimistic sides, you know, because as you mentioned, we are wired to uh, pay attention to bad news. And at the same time, we tend to be overly optimistic. And uh, what I found works for me, which is of course only anecdata, uh, is that I can contrast the pessimistic view with, uh, you know, something that gives hope. So basically, why not uh, try to go somewhere higher and, you know, uh, to a big audience and uh, try to implement the changes uh, like, uh, let's say, taxing uh, air travel more and uh, you know, relaxing tax measures for train travel and such or changing the education system in terms of, of making the political system work going into politics um two things in the first place over here you may have heard of a guy called uh, bernie sanders um he tried to do that look what happened to him yeah uh, on the other in terms of me going into politics believe me julie it's a fantasy i have entertained for fucking decades 
I would love to be king of the world or even king of this little part of it, right? But I'm going to plagiarize some. I think it was, was it Bill Maher? Some sort of politically incorrect talk show host, anyhow, on this side of the world, a few years back was also told that he should go into politics. And his response was perfect. He said, I believe that religion is bad and I believe that drugs are good. Now find me a campaign manager. Yeah. But I mean, unless someone tries. <laughs> but anyway, uh, before we got here, uh, I was also asking about, let's say, the farther future of scientific methodology and whether you think that uh, we'll keep the scientific method per se or whether in the future we will also arrive to knowledge by very, very different methods that we would consider unscientific now. Um, well, to some extent, we're already doing that for about at least 10 years now. We've had these things called proof assistants. Um, and more lately, we've got machine learning where you have neural nets examining vast data sets and uncovering patterns and correlations that um, mere mortals could never derive. Um, echopraxia to me was, was kind of a thought experiment. Um, I don't necessarily buy any of the things I propose in any of my books. I'm just playing around with ideas. And in fact, there are a lot of ideas in my books that I profoundly and deeply and desperately hope are not true. Um, in echopraxia, it was not so much that, that we had grown past the need for science or that we were using religion to, to make discoveries. Um, rather, what was happening was that because of various side effects of wiring up hyperparietal lobes and stuff, you would get these side effects like speaking in tongues that didn't actually have functional significance, but like, you know, two linked genes on the same chromosome, they would appear simultaneously. Yeah. So there were, there were these, there were these processes that, that, um, appeared to be religious and were not accessible by standard method scientific methodology because a lot of that is sort of conscious and consciousness is this tiny little scratch pad that not much fits into which, which is why basic science you have people having dreams yeah in which the solutions to complex problems are sort of served up to them. This actually happened to me. I solved my master's degree. I woke up at three, two o'clock in the morning with a dream about how I could fix something that had got me spinning my wheels for like two months. And I've hauled out a VIC-20 computer, if you can believe it, with like 20K of memory. I wrote a regression program because the mainframe wasn't open until eight and I'd solved my, my master's thesis. As a result of something I experienced in a dream. This happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, anecdotes say that the structure of benzene uh, was discovered in a dream, or Mendeleev uh, yeah. sort of structured the periodic table of elements in a dream. Yeah, this stuff happens all the time. And I think it's because the subconscious is very smart, yeah. but there's a limit to how much, how many notes it can pass to the conscious. So it basically does all the heavy lifting and then it gives us the answer. So basically what I was positing in echopraxia was that there was a group that had just basically gone to town with that, that you, ba you trust the subconscious to do the work and you do not have conscious access to how that work gets done. Doesn't mean necessarily that it's not scientific. Doesn't mean that it is scientific. It's just, we don't have access to how it works. Yeah. And in this particular case, there was some, there was some major neurological tweaking going on because we evolved in a classical universe, so we can internalize classical Newtonian mechanics very easily, but quantum mechanics makes absolutely no intuitive sense of this at all because there's no percentage when you're on the belt being chased by tigers or, or you know, competing for mates. There's no percentage in knowing anything about the space between atoms. So these guys literally rewired their brain so that the space between atoms was as intuitive to them as 
a dog catching a thrown ball would be intuitive yeah. to the dog. But the trade-off was now they can't catch thrown balls. So they can basically walk, you know, they can't basically go to the bathroom without having help wiping their asses. It was an interesting thought experiment. And I do think that that with the advent of AI, more and more science is going to be done and sort of handed down from the mountaintop to us and we will not be able to follow it. I mean, proof assistants are the classic example. They they give us these these theorems and we pretty much now have to take a lot of them on faith. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, the correlations are spurious. There's this famous case, I don't know, maybe it's apocryphal. I know that some of the cases I've been citing have proven to be apocryphal, but but there was this one case about an AI that was basically using genetic algorithms, it was told to generate a sine wave. And what it ended up doing was building a radio receiver that tapped into a machine in the next room that was already generating sine waves and just stealing that signal. Um, if you're building a society or a spaceship or a building based on these correlations, you damn well better hope that those correlations hold. And there's work going on to say, you know, we're going to have to make our AIs more transparent. We're going to have to. Um, but let's face it, the low hanging fruit has largely been has largely been picked. And the stuff that continues to flummox us is stuff that makes no sense. I mean, we have to be kicked. We have to be dragged kicking and screaming to, you know, math drags us kicking and screaming to quantum stuff. None of it makes any sense to the gut. On the other hand, uh we will probably be able to test at least some of this stuff using, let's say, regular scientific methods and uh, repeated measures. And as you mentioned, the low hanging fruit, in my view, it's often not uh, picked so thoroughly because there's still some publication bias and positive yeah. results tend to get published more easily. So in fact, uh, especially in some fields like psychology, but even in medical sciences, uh, especially in medicine testing, it, it has been shown statistically that lots of these results are false, but they haven't been reproduced enough. So uh, that's a really good point, any... and I would I would argue that that's another case in point for the corporatization of science in medical science, especially the stuff that that shows what you. There is apparently one case where they found um, that a placebo actually worked better than the, the chemical treatment. So they marketed the placebo. Um, yeah, I have you heard of a guy called Lee Smolin? Uh, yeah, I have at the Perimeter Institute. He's like, I'm all you guys are way, way beyond me. Right. And well, my expertise is old and it was on Harbor Seals. But according to Smolin, if I'm if I'm reading his his pop science books right, um, the laws of nature themselves were probabilistic; that they kind of evolved over time. He, he's, his view is that of a maverick. Yeah, that's um, something that uh, Henri Poincaré started with in the 19th century, but uh, he basically didn't say that they changed over time but that they could change in like some uh, portions of space. Uh, I was an interesting scientist. <laughs> I'm always finding stuff. Wasn't there, wasn't there a paper that came out just a couple of weeks ago showing that there were certain aspects of the cosmological constant that did not seem to be consistent across the observable universe? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's I, I guess Frank Herbert in Dune had this quote where all proofs ultimately rest on propositions which have no proofs. <laughs> and so if something is just extremely, if you've got a correlation that's extremely likely, it's still not a physical law. There's still the possibility that the dice could flip another way. And one of the things that fascinated me about Smolin's conjectures was that, was that he basically said at the beginning of the universe, the laws of physics and so on were in flux. And this is pretty standard stuff. I, I'm not a physicist, but I have read that you know you get the, the the very the strong and the weak forces forming you know after the big bang various basically the universe rolls dice and and how these various parameters fall out was kind of up in the air at first and his argument is that they're still not entirely deterministic that as time unfolds the correlations congeal and become much stronger so that at this point we perceive them as laws 
but that we would not necessarily have perceived them with the same lack of variance if we'd gone back, you know, 10 yeah. billion years. Again, um, I have no idea whether this is bullshit or not. But, yes, are you but, planning to explore this in the sunflower cycle? For the viewers, uh, in the sunflower cycle, uh, the ship Areophora circles the galaxy, creating gates, and it takes a long time. And uh, you've mentioned previously that you want to take the series uh, halfway up to the heat death of the universe. So, yeah, I, interesting I, would in fact, I would, in fact, like to say, A, yeah. And B, I would like to talk to you off screen about this at some point in the future, because I I seriously need people who know more than me, which basically would involve pretty much anybody in the subject except Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I would I could really use the insights of somebody with your background just to make sure that I'm not well, proposing a My background is evolutionary biology. <laughs> seriously? So, really not a oh, Sorry, for some reason I thought you had a physics. <laughs> I thought you had a physics bent in there. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I know about evolutionary biology. I don't need you. <laughs> but then I probably yeah, shouldn't have mansplained to you about the whole Evo psych girls are programmed <laughs> to shop thing either. You're probably really aware of that. <laughs> well, sorry. But the, are you planning to use this concept in sunflowers? The idea, I have an idea for the, the punchline at the end of sunflowers which actually explains why I'm calling it sunflowers in the first place. Because if you've read the stories, nobody mentions a sunflower or a yeah. tulip or a philodendron or anything through any of the stories. So there are reasons for calling it sunflowers at the end, which will become apparent at the end. Um, my fear is that the punchline will be so obvious and so basic and so, for want of a better word, Newtonian that it won't be that great and it'll be kind of a wet squib at the end. My other fear is that science will overtake it and it will no longer be plausible. One of the, probably the hardest SF story I ever wrote was cutting edge when I wrote it because at that point they thought the universe was going to collapse again. <laughs> and by the time it actually made it into print, we had discovered that not only was the universe continuing to expand, but that it was accelerating in its expansion, the whole dark energy thing, right? That was the uh, second coming of uh, Jenny. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And I mean, I didn't understand much of Tipler's story, and apparently it was like, apparently it was bullshit and it was not part, but he but, did make this prediction and his prediction, the Omega point hypothesis, was based on the idea that you'd have this massive event horizon at the end of, at the end of time. And that obviously isn't gonna happen if the universe just keeps expanding. Yeah. yeah. So I felt really smug about writing this cutting edge and yet character based story, um, but, which was, you know, and then by the time it comes out, it's already obsolete. It's already impossible. <laughs> um, well, it happens to hard to say, but since we've gotten uh, to the universe, do you have uh, any favorite space mission you have been or are following or is there any uh, anything in terms of space exploration, especially in astrobiology, but not only that, that you would like to see in your lifetime? I'm rather fond. I don't know who's doing it, but you must have heard of it. There's this this program where you basically get a few million little CubeSats, like the size of sugar cubes. Yes. And you stick solar sails on them and you use a laser to blast them off toward that. Kind of a dandelion seed dispersal mechanism. I think that's fascinating. I mean, obviously what I want is the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> you know, I want to go out there. We want to see, I mean, again, that's something else I've been fantasizing. I mean, hell, I was, I was finding much of my university education so boring that I actually had this parallel narrative going on in my mind about how the campus I was on was actually this big generation ship and how we all had to eat out of vending machines that aliens had left for us and so on. So that's what I want. In terms of things that are currently underway um, that I think might pay off and that have vision, those, those little sugar cubes I think are, are probably it, but I'm not, I'm not up on that stuff really. So far, I mean, for the past two months, two or three months, I haven't done anything except clicking the refresh button on the COVID kill count for the 
for the planet, right? So it's it's I've I've totally lost track of any any attempts to even keep up on the science lately. But if you were to uh, pick one place where to prioritize search for life in the solar system, which one would it be? Enceladus. Enceladus. How do you pronounce that? You know what I'm talking about anyhow, the moon, the ice moon. Um, or possibly Europa. I think I think the odds are, at this point are more... Actually, I so. would go with Enceladus simply because it's easier. I mean, the geysers are regular in each apochronium, so yeah. they can just fly there with a sampler and... Uh, and they've got... And it's also got that weird dynamo effect happening, right? You've got yes. like a... Apparently there are plans afoot to build these like squid probes that would actually power themselves off the magnetic gradient of, of Enceladus using uh, basically this, this this dynamo effect as it orbits the primary. This basically would be possible on Europa. I don't think uh, it would be possible on Enceladus, but no? Jupiter has an inclined magnetic field. So it generates the, uh, uh, you know, uh, generated magnetic field of Europa and uh, it should be possible there. I'm not sure about Enceladus because okay. yeah. Saturn's magnetic field right. is not, uh, not so inclined and Enceladus doesn't have a generated uh, magnetic field, so yeah. Well, you're speaking with much more confidence to this than I am, so um, obviously I got my, I got my moons anyway, mixed up. I see models, these are really exciting. And yeah. well, if we visit another one of them, Saturn's moon Titan, we could probably find exotic life there in the methane ethane lakes. Uh, and what's your take on our chances of finding exotic life, uh, you know, uh, with some other uh, solvent than water or perhaps not carbon-based life? Uh, and really detecting it in the near future. My um, my biochemistry background is so poor that I'm not competent to answer that. I mean, I know that that you know silicon is kind of a a possibility, but the number of configurations that can, that it can make with other with other atoms is so low compared to carbon. Blah blah blah. One thing. Um, that I do basically go to sleep with under my pillow every night is Richard Dawkins' definition of life. Um, Dawkins defined life as information shaped by natural selection. And I've loved the simplicity and the elegance of that because all the other definitions of life I've encountered have been grocery lists of things that life has, attributes of life not the function of life, not what life is, but it's got to have a metabolism and it's got to have a membrane and it's got to reproduce and it's got to squeak when you poke it with a stick. And all of that. Natural information shaped by natural selection is such a perfect distilled nub of a definition. And the cool thing is, is it leaves the materials that make up the chassis completely up in the air. It could be anything. And I do believe that it's parsimonious to assume that when we run into other life forms, they will probably be mechanical. They will probably be machines just because it's much easier to program an, a, a von Neumann probe to explore the universe than it is to, to, to lug around an Empire State's building's worth of oxygen and, and, and cyanobacteria. So I expect that that, you know, whether or not we're going to, and again, again, if you have a machine intelligence that follows the definition of natural selection, um, you would call it alive. Uh, I think we're on the verge of having electronic viruses that are literally alive. Um, yeah, I, have, I mean, in Maelstrom, uh, you have introduced this concept, and so yeah. And I think the only reason people haven't done that yet is because they realize that when they're building viruses, they they want those viruses to steal your credit card information yeah. or to break your computer. And so they, evolve, yeah. they don't want this thing to go off on its own and following its own agenda. Yeah. Um, but people have been doing it since the eighties in like Tierra models and like closed circuit systems and so on. Yeah. So I, I think that, that um, I think 
that in terms of uh, without any expertise at all on what physical form life would take i think okay. that we can detect the pattern that is indicative of life in terms of anything that slows down the increase of entropy yeah um anything that takes that kind of fire hose of entropy and splits it into a bunch of capillary tubes the water still goes through you still end up at heat death but it's had to go through some really interesting side you know scenic routes in getting there and i think there are probably going to be thermal and and informational telltales that we will be able to detect so so in a sense we're really only looking at one facet when we're looking for oxygen and water in a planet's atmosphere i think we should be looking for something more information theory based i don't know what that would be but there's got to be some kind of a telltale digital signature of life that, that yeah. we could scan the heavens for on the other hand it's all uh, i mean unless you're uh, detecting uh, radio sources or laser signals or assuming that uh, life's acting I don't know, uh, on microwaves, uh, it's hard to detect this thing remotely. And if you don't have something that signals uh, on vast distances, then uh, you have to uh, detect informational traces, you know, in situ. And this can also be quite complicated. So this is, uh, I mean, yeah. I love the definition. I think it's the most uh, adequate one. But uh, for practical detection, it's got uh, some problems. And uh, to, uh, for example, use uh, your story, The Island, uh, which was reprinted in Strangest of All, uh, and is actually the beginning of the sunflower cycle. As an example, uh, the crew can clear, clearly see that the island is alive. Uh, and so that's no problem with detection, but uh, uh, definition of life uh, posited by Richard Dawkins, I really like it. On the other hand, uh, we usually don't have time to observe the time scales of natural selection. If we're trying to uh, say whether something's alive and in your story, the island, we can clearly see that the island is alive. But the question is uh, whether uh, it originated purely by natural selection or whether it's an artificial object made by bioengineering. And I'm very interested in your take on that. I mean, do you see any way how the island could have evolved? I played around with the idea. I mean, you, you made a really good point in your in your commentary on that story. Um, I mean, if if we sat down over beers, I might be able to sort of hand wave some kind of a, you know, a bunch of tardigrades linked arms and, you know, something. Uh, after all, I am the guy who came up with a neurological rationale for vampires being afraid of crucifixes, but, but yeah, plausibly, no, I mean, you're probably right in that bioengineering is a far more parsimonious explanation for a structure like that. Um, but by the same tech, by the same uh, token, that almost becomes kind of a magic wand, right? You can use it like nanotech, anything that... that uh, Anything that's exotic or weird that you can't really figure out, you just say, "Well, it was bioengineered that way." Honestly, I didn't. I wasn't thinking much about uh, its evolutionary trajectory when I wrote the story. The story was originally written essentially as a kind of a raspberry blown out of all those lame ass Stargate stories, where where everybody is like oh boy we found we found the ancient superhighways left behind by the ancients we don't have to develop the technology by for ourselves nobody ever seemed to say wow those poor bastards who did have to build the thing they really had a rough road oh didn't they <laughs> um so i uh so i was basically playing around with that and it was also in the context of i i, I th thought of the whole sunflower cycle as a great premise for a video game. 
So I just basically wanted to come up with a mission level, a sort of a proof of concept to see if I could play with that. And so I played around a little bit with the biology of how it worked in the moment, um, how it got that way was something I didn't even think about. And mm -hmm. now you've got me, um, I mean, I just liked the idea of a giant balloon Dyson sphere, like a live Dyson sphere. I've never seen that. I mean, maybe I haven't read the right stories, but I've never seen that in science fiction before. Yeah, me neither. And, and I thought it's just, and, and the idea of this almost like a delicate soap bubble around a star, I just, it, it's one of the few ideas I've had, like most of the ideas I had fill me with a sense of, of existential dread. <laughs> um, this idea actually filled me with wonder, that whole sense of wonder thing that, that, that good old fashioned science fiction was supposed to come up with. I thought, wow, that's beautiful. Let's, let's make that. Mm -hmm. uh, since I'm, I've got to do something about Iriophora, they've got to have an encounter of some kind. I've got to introduce the concepts. This, this concept had been kicking around for a while, a live Dyson sphere, and I thought, let's, let's just throw that in there. Um, but you're right. Thank you very much, Julie. I now feel completely dissatisfied with that story in hindsight. And uh, so now I'm going to have to actually sit down, even if only for my own satisfaction, and try and think if there's some way that I can envision something like that evolving naturally. And you're <laughs> probably right. I will probably fail. But by God, I'm going to try. <laughs> Well, I think this is an excellent way to wrap up the interview with the sense of wonder and, you know, trying to <laughs> come up with new scientific ways for these awesome things. So is there anything else you'd like to uh, tell the viewers and readers of Strangest of All? Possibly uh, what new fiction they can expect from you or any take home message? Um. No, I think I've given them quite enough take home messages already. And in terms of new projects, um, there's only two and I can't talk about either of them now for contractual reasons. Um, and they've probably heard me talk enough anyway. So this is a good place to end it. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much for the interview. And uh, for the viewers, if you want to check out Peter's stuff, Go to his website, rifters.com, and you can find most of his writing uh, online freely available. Uh, so do check it out. And if you haven't read Strangest of All yet, I have good news for you. It's also freely available as a non-commercial educational project. And you can download this book of astrobiological science fiction accompanied by nonfiction essays at my website, julienovakova.com or on the website of the European Astrobiology Institute, uh, europeanastrobiology.eu. So thanks so much for your time, Peter. And next time, we'll... time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next time Bye. we'll return with one of the other authors. Bye. Bye.